All right, let's get this thing on because uh, is that the real time? Panthers play in an hour. Yes, sir. And yeah, Mrs. Campbell. Five minutes. Yeah. So. They're gonna win tonight. Catch you, lead fish. I hope so. <laughs> Five Seven Productions is proud to present the Masonian, a monthly podcast for Freemasons with a focus on the grand jurisdiction of North Carolina. While not an official function of the Grand Lodge of North Carolina, we operate with the full endorsement of Grand Master Gene Cobb. The opinions expressed on this show are those of the participants and in no way reflect the opinions of the Grand Lodge of North Carolina, its members, or any appendant bodies. 357 Productions does own the rights to this music, as always, and we love playing it. Although, our guest tonight has recommended that we maybe try some classical here and there so uh but tonight we are very fortunate uh we have with us uh our very own uh brother steve campbell from blackmer lodge number 127 our home lodge uh he is a retired high point police officer captain uh hence captain campbell we call him captain campbell you've heard us refer to him a lot on the show as captain campbell and he is currently the grand historian so captain we're glad to have you tonight thank you all right so here's the deal with captain campbell we, uh, we've been wanting to get him on the show for a long time, and um, we just kept kind of putting it off and putting it off. And the reason was that Captain Campbell is both in our Blue Lodge at Blackmer and only lives maybe 15 miles from here. So I kept thinking, you know, we have a lot of people from across the state that we'd hit a day where somebody had to cancel or we had weather issues or, you know, we just didn't have a guest, and, and it'd be pretty easy to, to, to grab him. And uh, so we've kind of had that in our hip pocket for a long time. And now, as it turns out, he's, uh, he, he's not going to be the uh, grand historian next year. And so he's going to have a little more time on his hands. I'm sure he's happy about that. But if we were going to get him while he was grand historian, now was the time. And we did want to have him on the show while he was actually the grand historian. And then he so. turned into a rock star. And he's been going all over the state doing uh, presentations everywhere. and lectures. Everywhere. How many, how many places have you been to lecture in the last couple of years, you know? Well, just this year alone, it'll be 50 between lodges, civic groups, church groups, and uh, schools. And you've written something for the North Carolina Mason just about every time, haven't you? For the last two years, yes. Well, you know, Captain Campbell, I just want to tell you, uh, on behalf of me personally and the staff here and, and um, you know, the guys at Blackmer, and really on, you know, on behalf of all the Masons in North Carolina, we, we sure are proud of the job that you've done. I know you've, you've really burned it at both ends. You've, you've done yeoman's work. Uh, you've been very busy, and, uh, and, and you know, sometimes you don't get told thank you a lot, but thank you for all that you've done for the Grand Lodge. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And then the other thing is I don't think a lot of people fully understand. I mean, the Grand Historian is a big deal. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're telling history. You're, you're helping preserve our craft. Um, and not only do you help preserve the craft, but North Carolina history. Um, you know, when I first met you, you know, we went on several field trips to different battlefields and different things. And, I mean, it was awesome. I mean, it was like literally walking around with a talking textbook. And, I mean, it, it was so enlightening. I, I know when we went to Greensboro and, and different places, I mean, it was just – I had a blast. Um, it, it was just really good. So I really appreciate that aspect, not just for Freemasonry, but for history as a whole. Um, I love talking military and listening to him talk military and battles mm -hmm. and stuff like that. That is just – it's awesome. And I, I really appreciate that. Well, you're very kind. Thank you, Riley. It's one of the perks of, uh, of, of having the Grand Historian in your lodge. You get to uh, tag along on a lot of cool little field trips and stuff. So he's drug us all over the state. And uh, really, we, we went to Gettysburg here not too long ago. And uh, he uh, was the docent, to use his word, uh, up there on that trip and taught us an awful lot about it. And so, yeah, he's a cool guy to just – just hang out with, uh, even if we're not talking history and chasing history stuff, uh, super cool guy to hang out with. So anyway, thank you for coming tonight, and uh, thank you for all that you've done for the Grand Lodge. You uh, you wanted to lead off with a script. He, he, Captain, It's always a little different when you have Captain Campbell. He has his own agenda usually, and he said that he wanted to lead off with a script, so here's your time. Press on, sir. Well, Captain Campbell's a planner, and I want to thank everyone for the time to do this this evening. And I just want to give a little bit of background because when I was appointed to this position, several folks told me they didn't know the Grand Lodge had a Grand Historian. But it's an annual appointment made by the Grand Master, and it's been my honor to have been selected by Grand Master Bryant Webster in 2016, along with a reappointment by Gene Cobb for 2017. Uh, I first spoke with my predecessors, as I would always do when I took over a new assignment, uh, Dr. Rick Smith and Dr. Michael Brantley. And 
I asked him for their uh, advice as to what the Grant Historian should do. And Dr. Brantley made mention, he said, you should follow your passion. And my passion is 18th and 19th century America, though folks, as I look around this room, continue to try to drag me into the 21st century. My focus is really on the human factor and how it's reflected in history. And I've had a series called The Battlefield and Beyond. And of the 20 lectures that I do in North and South Carolina, Virginia, 15 of them center around members of our fraternity. And I think it's important to know that the men who came before us and their ladies were people just like we were. They just were set in certain times in history and made a lot of difference. So that's really good. Also, the Grand Lodge Speakers Bureau is a site, if you've never visited that, I would strongly recommend that you go to that site. It's a wealth of information for any lodges, civic groups, or anyone that's looking for speakers to broaden people's horizons. It's a great platform to obtain speakers that will travel throughout the state and not only cover the fraternity, but our state history, regional history, and national history. And you have to remember, here's what a historian does. We don't create history. A historian researches, records, and reports on people and events of the past. My annual goals, encompassed, have been pinning a Masonic history-related article for the North Carolina Mason for the last two years, traveling throughout North Carolina, presenting Masonic education programs and lodges, as well as large social events, and lodge social events as well, ladies' dinners and past master's dinner. Also responding to requests that I received from not just North Carolina, but from out of state on Masonic facts and doing the research at Grand Lodge and other records that we've had access to, and being permitted to create the North Carolina Masonic Keepsake Postcard Collection. As you look here, you've seen these displays. I've taken them throughout the state. And someone says, well, postcards, nobody really writes postcards anymore. However, I've had several people tell me that they frame them for a keepsake. They depict early and current Masonic history, and they're based on the murals at our Grand Lodge at the Great Hall by the late nationwide, internationally famous artist, Alan Cox. Alan Cox not only did the grand murals at our Grand Lodge in Raleigh, your Grand Lodge in Raleigh, he also painted the murals at the George Washington Masonic National Memorial and the United States Capitol. So we're very fortunate to have that. The money that we're raising selling these postcard keepsake collection is going to preserve our Masonic historic buildings as well as resting places for the men who came before us because we don't want to forget those men. And that's why we've really been trying to raise this money for this cause. And finally, enlisting statewide support for our Grand Lodge and support throughout the state. We really want to support the George Washington Masonic National Memorial. And a nationwide effort is being done, and we're coming up in the first century of this edifice that's been raised in honor of our number one Freemason, Brother George Washington. So that's what we're trying to do in raising the money for the restoration and preservation because we don't want to forget those that came before us. It's been an honor to have served as your grand historian for the last two years. And I want you each to remember something you take away from this. And again, thank you for the brothers having this presentation tonight. History is the trail we each leave behind. We learn from our stumbles, rise from our falls, and move forward. And that's what our fraternity does because so many of our men in our fraternity have led the way in our nation and throughout the world. Thank you, Ben. All right on, all right. It was excellent. Hey, while, while you're at it and while you're on a roll, you want to talk about the George Washington National Masonic Memorial and your duties tied to that? Well, fortunately, uh, past Grand Master Doug Caller has selected a handful of us Masons here in North Carolina, and we're serving ambassadors for the George Washington Masonic National Memorial. It started in 1910. The cornerstone was laid in 1923. It is a memorial to Brother George Washington that belongs to every Mason in the United States. No public money, no government money has ever been used in raising this building. And now we're in the midst of a $6 million restoration and preservation. We're raising money throughout the nation. And that's one of the messages that we ambassadors want to spread throughout the state of North Carolina, that that memorial belongs to all of us to honor George Washington. And Sean Iyer works there. He does indeed. He was actually, I attended a two-day seminar, and Brother Sean was the facilitator for our seminar. And I've got more facts. I haven't transcribed all the notes yet. He's a super good dude. He spoke at Sophia. We just we love Sean. He's a he's a real academic uh, guy, but one of the smartest fellows you'll ever meet. He's just uh, and a good and a good fellow. Very learned, very learned in fraternity and uh, a wealth of information. So this thing with the uh, George Washington National Masonic Memorial. There's some more 
There's so so um, most worshipful brother Caudill is involved, and you, and there's some more guys, right? Yes, uh, uh, worshipful uh, past master Doug Caudill has been appointed to the board of directors, and they've selected four of us to serve in ambassadors. It's Michael Aithcock and uh, Brian Penley, Brandon Penley, uh, Mike. Oh, his name is Kate in Hillsborough, and myself. And it's a really an honor to receive this appointment. We've set our goals. And the bottom line is to make more people aware because, unfortunately, the George Washington Masonic National Memorial, like our own Grand Lodge, 90% of our brothers have never been. I'd strongly encourage, not just having served as your Grand Historian for the last two years, but I would strongly recommend that all brothers go and visit our Grand Lodge in Raleigh. It belongs to all of us, brothers, and I would really encourage you to make that trip to Raleigh. Good field trip, plenty of restaurants, and the staff there, all five of them, are very accommodating. They will show you everything. And, and the memorial in Alexandria. The memorial in Alexandria it's easy to, it's easy, easy to get to. It right? is easy to get to. Uh, access a uh, reasonable uh, nominal fee to get in. Uh, a collection of not just Masonic related articles and items about George Washington, but about his personal life too. Yeah. So you, you talk about a lot of things. I guess this George Washington National Masonic Memorial thing. They can get you to do that through. Uh, through the Speakers Bureau that you were talking about? Yes, that's going to be added. And actually what we're going to be doing is we have uh, literature we're going to be passing around in regards to the uh, Memorial's uh, landmark century campaign. Again, the cornerstone was laid in 1923. And so we're really going to be pushing that message out throughout the state of North Carolina. And the George Washington Rules of Civility, a nice little handbook that we're going to give out free to everyone. It's a great read for your nieces, nephews, uh, grandchildren, children. And it's basically uh, 101, how to have manners, and still applies from the 18th century to the 21st century. So you guys, um, I, I guess you're going to, you can get all, any of those guys to come speak in your lodge, probably through the Speakers Bureau. If not, y'all ought to put them on there. And you will continue to talk about any other historical things, right, I'm assuming? Yes, I will. And, and you can get that through the Speakers Bureau. Yes. Well, what are some of the programs you offer? Well, the Speakers Campbell? Bureau, the, actually there's one called the George Washington Collection that's going to tie into the uh, George Washington Masonic Memorial, and it's about Washington at war, George Washington's marriage, uh, the Battle of Trenton crossing the Delaware that we've all thought that we knew a lot about, but there's a lot of facts hidden, and so many Freemasons played a big role in that, and along with George Washington's wife, and here locally about uh, Richard Montgomery, Brother Montgomery, one of the first Brigadier Generals ever named in United States history, was uh, the namesake of this county and 16 other states, and he was a good brother in good standing when, tragically, he was killed in Quebec. We've got Rebellious and Resolute, just about Freemasons and their role in the Revolutionary War. Then the only thing I leave the country is about a field in Belgium when we talk about all the brothers that were involved in the Battle of Waterloo. The mission in Texas, you'll be surprised at the Alamo, how many of the main players were involved in that. And that little uh, creeper there, even Santa Ana, the general that was fighting for the Mexicans, was a brother as well. Then we jump over to things like Arlington National Cemetery and the men and fraternity that are buried there. And we also cover the Battle of Fredericksburg, Gettysburg, you may recall, that was in the North Carolina Mason not long ago. Uh, our broken band of brothers, distinctly three men who were members of our fraternity, men in good standing, whose lives were altered and changed that day. And then, of course, the keystone, the roughest rider, Brother Theodore Roosevelt. He's done so much in his 60 years of life that there's two separate programs, Buffalo Bill Cody, and then we have the human factor and how it impacts history, along with reflections through the prism of history, which is mostly quoting Freemasons of the past in our nation's young history of only 241 years, and their women beside them, and what they said back then, and how things really apply today, which is just an example that human nature's not changed since biblical times, only technology has. Hmm. So all of those are programs that you do and will come do for a blue uh, for a blue lodge. Any lodge, uh, Scottish right? I've spoken to all different levels in mis uh, masonry. I'll be happy to come again. Like Brother Ben said, just go to the Speakers Bureau. And again, the George Washington Masonic National Memorial will be tagged in with that as well. So Captain Campbell is retired, so he can travel, uh, you know, a fair amount and, and does travel a fair amount. So a lot of times you just ask that people kind of put you up. You've stayed in a lot of people's private homes, I know. I have several brothers throughout the state are very kind, very gracious. And when I uh, convey to them that I'm a retired, non-corrupt civil servant, it always gets my foot in the door. <laughs> so, Captain, i got to ask, you, outside of this paper, I know you have done numerous, numerous presentations. Wh which one is your true passion? Which is your... What is your favorite presentation that you give? That would be the Washington Collection, and it's a collection of five different programs I do about Brother George Washington, his family, his personal life. 
uh, and his wife as well and the relationship that Martha had with him and how she supported him in all his endeavors. You must remember, George Washington lived to be but 67, and 46 of those years he was a member of our fraternity. And, and, so, the, and so he was raised at Fredericksburg, is that yes, right? Yes, Fredericksburg number four. And it still exists? It does. They're not in the same building. They're in a more modern building, only from the 19th century. Mm -hmm. But he was raised there and stayed in good standing, and he became the master of Alexandria Lodge 22, which, of course, is now the Alexandria Washington Lodge number 22, but he was master there. There was a move after the Revolutionary War, actually during the Revolutionary War for our independence, where we wanted to create a uh, national grandmaster, of course, that did not come through. And Washington actually told them he was a bit busy during that eight-year conflict. The man did not go home one time in eight years except for a fleeting three-day visit on the way to Yorktown. And he continued his Masonic duties during that time as well. So you can either go to Fredericksburg, where he was raised, or you can go to AW-22, which is still in existence, and meets in the George Washington National Masonic Memorial, right? That's right. It's a replica of the original lodge room there in Alexandria. Yeah, and so they're a traditional observance lodge or an observant lodge, as, as uh, Andrew would call it. Um, so you'll want to dress up if you go to that one for sure. I don't know about Fredericksburg. Have you ever sat in Fredericksburg? No, it's on my bucket list of places to go. I've not quite made it there, but that's on my list to go to. Have you been George by? Washington. Oh, yeah, I'm very familiar with Fredericksburg and George Washington's sister's manor. His ha her house is a uh, memorial now and a museum. George Washington's mother, Mary Ball, Washington's home is a museum. You can tour that. And uh, I do hope to sit in that lodge soon. Earlier, Brother Riley was talking about my travels. I did have the honor this past year of sitting in the oldest lodge west of the Blue Ridge Mountains, which is in Winchester, Virginia, in the Shenandoah Valley, and it was begun in 1768. Wow. It's been a while. It has, and they're still in good standing, and they're a very strong lodge. Well, uh, while we're kind of hitting Virginia, while we're in the Virginia area, go ahead, why don't you go ahead and tell them about Arlington and Washington's ties to it, even though it's not really necessarily Masonic. Right. Well, Arlington National Cemetery evolved from the Arlington Estate, of course, and uh, George Washington's stepped adopted grandson built that place. Uh, unfortunately, I turned the records over. He was not a member of the fraternity. Uh, George Washington's stepson left that property to him. Uh, over the years, it evolved into what's become known as Arlington National Cemetery, over 1,100 acres, over 400,000 graves. And uh, there's a lot of Masonic connections there, quite a few Freemasons that have laid to rest in Arlington National Cemetery, and it's duly noted in the records there. So it was originally, you know, just a house, right, and before there was the cemetery there? Yes, originally yeah, Arlington, all that story. Arlington was a 1,100-acre uh, estate, and uh, George Washington's step-grandson, George Washington Park Custis uh, built that as a memorial to George Washington. The original name was called Mount Washington. And then he named it after his family's traditional estate from the 17th century in Eastern Virginia. And unfortunately, during the War of Secession, the unpleasantness, uh, the property was uh, seized as a result of uh, a legal matter. Uh, Robert E. Lee's wife owned the property. She was George Washington Park Custis' uh, daughter, hence uh, Martha Washington's granddaughter. And the property was sold at auction, and the only bidder was the U.S. government, and uh, they evolved into Arlington National Cemetery. As time went on, it's a much more involved story. However, as time went on, the lead descendants continued to sue the federal government for the seizure of the property. And in 1883, the Supreme Court ruled that it was seized illegally, even though it was uh, sold at auction. And the Lee family was rewarded Arlington back. However, at that time, there were several thousand graves and they didn't want to live there. It was after Robert E. Lee and his wife's demise. The family didn't want to move back, and they were given the fair market price of $150,000, which ironically was presented to the Lee family by Robert Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's sole surviving son, who was the Secretary of War. What, a, what an interesting story, isn't it? Well, you have the human factor. It's uh, When you look at the people and get beyond the divisions, the brigades, the regiments, and you look at the people, they were people just like we were, just set in a certain time. Captain Campbell, what do you? What's your take on the the memorials uh, that everybody's trying to tear down from the from the Civil War? It's a situation that has evolved before. It's presented itself before. It ebbs and flows. Uh, society's going through a change. It goes through changes every decade or so. So unfortunately, it happens. Yet it's nothing new, and the storm will be weathered. I'm sure it will. I mean, I don't know. I have mixed emotions about it. But the the problem is, where do you stop? Because, you know, as you go further back in history, more and more of our founding fathers were slave owners. And I mean, what are we going to do? We're going to take everybody's statue down? Well, you've got to remember, I mean, I, I, I'm certainly sympathetic to the reason that, that, 
that they want to take them down, but there's no end to it. Yeah, where do you stop the There's machine? not an end game. Yeah. Well, you've got to remember, too, in my limited knowledge of history, uh, first of all, slavery is immoral and unethical, but yet it wasn't illegal. And there's still nations today where you can buy people in, in the on the continent of Africa. It's still legal. But you got to remember, ever since the ancients, uh, to include the Israelites, the Egyptians, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, the British, the French, the Spanish, the Japanese, the Chinese, every society has had some type of slavery. The United States is a very young nation. Uh, we've only been here for 241 years and we've accomplished so much. Uh, slavery came and went. It was a hard chapter in our nation's history as was the war secession or the Civil War. But we weathered that. The American people remain on course. They're a resilient people. And the thing about it is there are still countless thousands if not millions of people that want to keep the flame of history aglow and that's what's so refreshing when I travel throughout the Carolinas of Virginia. I get to meet those people, and it's just not older people. I'm speaking to the middle school here in Montgomery County. I've spoken to the uh, several other schools. When you deliver the information, the facts, and you get past the emotion driven and you deliver the facts, young people seize on to that, as do most citizens when they're given the facts. Because at being a historian, when you remove yourself emotionally and politically from irresponsible, whether it be the media or office seekers or office holders, facts are stubborn things. Amen. Uh, since I know you're, you're a Washington guy, uh, talk a little bit about uh, Washington staff during the war. How many of those guys were Freemasons? And specifically, do you think they were on his staff because they were Freemasons? Or were they just an awful lot of Freemasons in, in the gentry class back then? And and uh, just, just just kind of ramble about all that for a little well, while. Well, in Washington staff, we have 32 young men. He specifically selected the young and bright. About a third that we know were possibly members of the fraternity. However, a fact goes that we know that at least 40% of the senior generals in the American War for Independence were members of the fraternity. Because if you remember, brothers, when you take that obligation and you kneel at that altar, you give your word to be there and to do what you say you're going to do. The only black sheep we've had, unfortunately, was a fellow that I'm getting ready to write an article and do a lecture on, would be our uh, bold and brazen black sheep, Brother Benedict Arnold, who was a brother and who Washington treated like a son and betrayed the country and betrayed Washington's trust. But he was a very complicated man, a member in good standing when he betrayed the country, but he lost his way. But yeah, the bond of so many of those men and true Many of the men that became officers were leaders in their community, and they were members of the fraternity. And actually, the membership of the fraternity doesn't grow a whole lot, excepting people who aren't members of the gentry, who aren't members of the ruling class, professional men, tradesmen, uh, elected officials, military leaders. That evolves later after the war secession when the fraternity opens up. But again, Washington knew, as did those other men, like he sent John Glover to get those boats across the Delaware, Brother John Glover. He needed the artillery at the Battle of Trenton, Brother Henry Knox. So when you look at those, Brother Richard Montgomery, one of the first eight men ever to become a general in the United States Army. So we know at least 40% of those men were members of our fraternity. You give him your word, you're going to be there. Amen. Can you talk about Lafayette just a little bit, just because I love him so much? Well, Lafayette, when he came here, uh, if you recall, Lafayette's father had been killed by the British. You know, the French and the British don't get along very well, and Lafayette's father had been killed in an earlier war. And Lafayette was pretty much micromanaged. He was a, he was a millionaire for the time, millionaire today perhaps. Uh, his life was controlled. He was married off when he was 16. His bride was 14. He was forbidden to come to America because he wanted to come in uh, liberty and equality to help the Americans throw off the yoke of English rule. And mainly, he was really upset because the British had killed his father. And uh, he had handlers, and what Lafayette did was he kind of broke the rules. He went out and bought his own ship, and he bought his own ship and came here to, and landed in Georgetown, South Carolina. And he came, and uh, he was influenced by liberty and equality, as I made mention. And then the Congress gave him a, a commission, which was really honorary. They made him a, a two-star general with no experience at the age of 19, the youngest ever American general. Uh, a lot of people say it's Armstrong Custer, but it was Lafayette at 19. And when he was introduced to uh, Washington, his English was broken, but uh, he had money. Washington took to him like a son because Washington, you may recall, never had any natural children. And Lafayette was used to go back and forth to France. He was a natural leader. Uh, he was wounded in battle. Uh, he wanted to prove himself in battle, not just be for uh, 
emissary duty, but he worked his way into the trust of Washington, uh, so much to the point where Washington influenced Lafayette. His son's firstborn son was named George Washington Lafayette. And of course, 17 titles in between that. Uh, if you look at Lafayette's name, he's got about eight names. And, uh, and, and Fayetteville's named after him? It is indeed. Uh, there, are several, uh, there are several counties and cities throughout the uh, United States are named after Lafayette. Unfortunately, uh, when he returns to France, he gets mired up in the uh, French Revolution, their civil war, and uh, he's on sides there and falls into favor and disfavor. And then during the unpleasantness when uh, France is fighting about all of Europe, uh, Lafayette was captured by the Austrians. He was in prison while Washington was president and he was beseeched to uh, come to his rescue on a personal note. However, George Washington drew the line between being president and being a brother, and he realized his duty was to the young country and to try to keep the young country out of war, which he was successful in. Lafayette languished in prison, although his family came to live with him, but later he was uh, freed. Uh, Washington, unfortunately, would perish before Lafayette came back and had a grand tour of the United States where he was treated like a hero throughout the, uh, the entire country. Yeah, I was, I was just fixing to ask you about Lafayette's tour. So apparently this was the thing. If, if you were really popular, you would do a tour because, of course, we didn't have the Internet and TV back then. T talk a little bit about Washington's tour where he apparently slept in every house and <laughs> stepped in every lodge that existed on the, within 100 miles of the coast. When George Washington became our first president in 1789, uh, like you made mention, the uh, – the quickest way to get the word out was by horseback or by boat or uh, by newspaper, of course, and things moved at a slower pace. Washington toured all the northern states. There were 13 states. He toured all the northern states first. And then in 1791, uh, Walter Bingham has written an excellent book you may want to get. It's called Washington's Tour, Southern Tour, 1791. Washington came unaccompanied except by a small staff of about six people and a couple of servants. Uh, Martha Washington was deathly afraid of travel, even though she would visit Washington. She had a fear of drowning. Her brother Bartholomew had drowned. Uh, the biggest way to get across a river back then was either by ferry, barge, or ford. And when Martha went to the Capitol at that time, you may recall the Capitol originally was in New York, then Philadelphia, she stayed there. And uh, he toured the southern states, of course, North Carolina, all of them. And he was met by a big military entourage of the militia and the elected officials. He was wined and dined in the, uh, the lodges throughout uh, the South. Uh, it was like a it was like a rock star because people had read about Washington, they'd heard about Washington, but they had never seen Washington. And it was the first time Washington had actually gone to uh, many of these places. He did not really come south in the Revolution. He stayed in the New England area, New York area, while the war was waged, and basically ended up being one here in the South. But uh, Washington. Uh, he came through Charlotte, called a trifling place. There were about 27 houses. Uh, the big places were uh, New Bern, where they rolled out the red carpet for him. And he stayed in the uh, Wright Stanley house, uh, Brother Stanley's house, uh, for whom Stanley County is named after, and who uh, killed uh, another brother there in New Bern, uh, uh, Dob Spate, Richard Dob Spate, our former governor. And uh, the two brothers got into a, pardon me, spitting contest. And on the fourth shot, it was single shot pistols, Brother Stanley killed him. But uh, he, had, he was deceased, and Washington stayed in his house. But uh, if Washington slept in every place they said, he would never have had time to do the trip. <laughs> was Nathaniel Green a brother? Uh, Nathaniel Green, we cannot find any records. We have searched and searched and searched. However, American Union Lodge, the pro prominent, preeminent military lodge, it seems like a lot of fellows joined that, but the records are here and there. However, we know that Nathaniel Green, who perished at the age of 42 of sunstroke at his plantation in Georgia, always wore a Masonic medallion. But we can't find any record of any lodge that he visited or any records of all of his going through the degrees. Uh, t tell everybody that doesn't know uh, more or less who he was and why he's famous. And well, Nathaniel Green was a Quaker fellow. His father was a uh, ironsmith. Uh, he grew up in the Quaker church, and he was a very intelligent fellow, well-read. Uh, when the War of Independence started, he enlisted as a private because uh, he'd had an accident. A, a piece of iron had fallen on one of his legs and he had a limp. So he didn't think that would be very good for an officer to display. However, through his intelligence, his capability, he was promoted and raised through the ranks very quickly. Washington trusted him. And again, that gives you suspicion that he must have been a member of the fraternity, again, for Washington to trust somebody because when he gave you the word, another brother gave you the word, you kept the word. Uh, Washington had recommended Green for several positions. Uh, the Congress interceded and passed him over, but 
After the uh, terrible calamity, we've been to the battlefield in Camden, one of the worst defeats of America by General Gates, and where Brother Lord Cornwallis and the British decimated the American forces. The Congress finally listened and appointed Nathaniel Green based on Washington's recommendation. And uh, he was finally victorious. Lost more battles than he won, but he won the war. And unfortunately, uh, he did perish at a really early age. He was living on a plantation that the uh, state of Georgia had awarded him for his service to the country because like a lot of these fellows, they spent their own money. And Green spent a lot of his own money, and he lost a lot of it, but Georgia gave him a plantation, and he died of sunstroke at the age of 42. So just uh, not to belabor the point, but, uh, but tell everybody a little bit about the running battle he had all the way up through uh, Greens that, and, and all the way up to Greensboro, Guilford Courthouse. Well, the entire campaign was uh, a hit and run. Uh, after Camden, the uh, debacle there with the Americans, uh, Green basically lost all of his battles, but we would rise, fight again, get beat, and rise to fight again was his uh, motto. Uh, Brother William Davy was his treasurer. He selected Davy because Davy was, of course, uh, so smart and so intelligent. And when Davy was appointed the position to run the treasury, and he was one to be in the field and fight like he had been doing, and basically uh, Nathaniel Green says, don't worry about the treasury because we don't have any money anyway. So uh, the, the campaign was up and down the Carolinas, South Carolina. The British did what we the Romans had done like we did in Vietnam. They set up base camps. And what happened was Green broke each one of those camps. Uh, Light Horse Harry Lee, Robert E. Lee's father, uh, Francis Marion, feather, brother Francis Marion, several of these fights. Brother uh, Light Horse Harry Lee, they were involved in the campaign to get where the British down. And Green would retreat and retreat and retreat. And he's so frustrated, uh, Brother Cornwallis, after the Battle of uh, Calpians, where Brother uh, Daniel Morgan defeated Bannister Tarleton's troops. Uh, Green, uh, was Cornwallis, no, Tarleton. no, Tarleton was not. Yeah. <laughs> Some people want him yeah. to be, but I can't find any record. <laughs> but, but brother, uh, Cornwallis was in good standing. But uh, basically, Green would fight these battles and escape and escape and escape. And Cornwallis got so frustrated that he stripped his entire army down of about 3,000 men, burned all their wagons and everything, and put everybody uh, trekking up and tried to uh, capture Green. But Green streaked past uh, the Dan River. And he did what uh, Brother Washington and Brother John Glover had done on the Delaware. They seized all the boats. And there's no bridges. I want brothers to realize there aren't bridges like there are today that you don't think about when you're driving across them. So the fords and the ferries and the boats. And Green seized all the boats on the Dan River. And basically, pick and chose his time. He had already selected that field to give for courthouse to wage a battle there. And that's what happened. We know that uh, Brother Davy was there, but not in the field command. We know several brothers were involved. The Americans technically lost because the British controlled the field. The Americans withdrew in good order. Cornwallis uh, won the battle, but uh, lost over 25% of his army, uh, would retreat back to Wilmington. And then from Wilmington, he trekked up to a place called Yorktown, and we know how that ended. That's right. So, from, so really from Camden all the way, that whole southern campaign that Green ran, there were a lot of brothers involved in that that were important to us in North Carolina. Who, who was the guy that was 12 years old? Was that Jackson? Andy Jackson was uh, actually, he and his brother, Hugh, were, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, scouts. But so some this people called them spies. That we're this we're is in South Carolina. Yep. Right. This is uh, before Green takes off. And Davey recognizes, uh, it's personal with brother Andrew Jackson. Uh, his uh, one brother died in a British prison ship. His mother contracted a fever and died tending to his soldiers in Charlestown. Uh, his brother and he were captured. His brother Hugh would later uh, die, and uh, both Hugh and Andy Jackson were captured. And the story is, and it's pretty true, a English lieutenant, British lieutenant, tried to get him to polish his boots, and uh, brother Andy said he wouldn't, and he slashed him, and he put his hand up, and he bore the scar across his hand and his face for the rest of his life. So there was no love lost there. But he was captured, and he was uh, escaped, but he was a courier for uh, brother uh, William R. Davy. And uh, William R. Davy gave him a pistol that Andrew Jackson carried for the rest of his life. Andrew Jackson was went on to be president, of course, and wasn't he grandmaster of Tennessee? Tennessee? Yes, he was. One of the two uh, presidents that have been grandmaster, mm -hmm. and another uh, being Truman, of course. Right, Harry Truman. So then as they started that, that trek up north, and then Davy gave him a fit around Charlotte, right? Right, the, yeah, the hornet's nest. Because with about 60 or 70 men, Davy held up the entire British Army, and Cornwallis was very upset and regrouped the army, and they fled away because uh, Davy was not a uh, Davy wasn't a, a foolish man. He realized when the odds were against him, he only had about one tactical setback in his entire career when he led his cavalry into there fighting against the British. 
And the Stokes brothers were involved in all that, right? They were. Unfortunately, one of the Stokes brothers was so badly wounded at the Battle of Waxhaws that field we visited where he was crippled and he was slashed and cut and everything. Uh, John that, and Montford. Right, John and Montford. And as I tell people, in, in the old days, a lot of people talk about the glory of war. Brothers, there's more glory than there is glory. Amen. So all this was kind of going on as part of Green's uh, campaign and that whole running battle. But down east, there was an entirely different uh, theater of the war going on. And we had some, some guys down there that are important in North Carolina Masonry. You want to talk about some of them? A lot of those were more involved in the, uh, of course, Robert Howe is the highest ranking North Carolinian that's uh, ever selected uh, to serve. Uh, We've got a lot more political activity because the British pretty much controlled the eastern part of North Carolina. That was their strong point, Wilmington and those areas there. Because it was closer to the ocean? Right, and they could be vastly supplied. Because you may, you have to remember, during the American Revolution, the Great Britain, England, they were the superpower like we are in the world today. And when those, when those colonies rebelled against them, it took eight years to win independence. And by the time it's over... You've got another connection where the French come in, several brothers are involved in that. You've got the French, the English are fighting the Dutch, the Spanish, and even surprising to a lot of people, the Tsarina of Russia, Catherine, was very fond of the American spirit, and she nearly came in and brought Russia to fight against the British as well. So England is fighting all over the world, not just in their American colonies. So all these guys that we keep talking about, the guys, the guys down east, um, the, the guys were in this campaign, the national guys th that were brothers, they weren't brothers of any Grand Lodge in North America because they didn't exist. They would have been under some other grand jurisdiction, right? Yeah, they were because like uh, with Washington's original, uh, the Lodge, Alexander 22, was granted a charter from the Lodge of Pennsylvania. And when Virginia created their Grand Lodge, of course, it goes back and becomes number 22 in Virginia. Yeah, but so many of the lodges, like you may mention, there is no Grand Lodge. But we know, based on facts, that brothers are meeting, the fraternity is growing, whether they're meeting in houses or taverns. The fraternity is continuing to grow strong. Now, during the War of Independence, it ebbs quite a while because you must remember so many of the people are gone, so many of the men are gone, and their actual lodge buildings, few and far between. But Yeah, probably so, because they didn't meet in buildings, right? They didn't own real estate back then. No. They met wherever they no. could. Taverns and but, people's homes. So some of those lodges would have been chartered by the Grand Lodge of England, mm -hmm. uh, probably some by the Grand Lodge of Scotland as time went on. Right. Grand Lodge of Ireland, we know that, that had a, a bunch chartered. Um, probably some of them are what they call occasional lodges. They were, like the, Ameri the military lodges. We know that 20 years before the Revolutionary War, we have French and Indian War lodges. And after that, they dissolve, they just disappear. But those men are still active in the fraternity. Some would have been ancients, and some mm -hmm. would have been moderns. Right. So it was kind of a mix. A brother was a brother, and there wasn't quite as much talk about this uh, amnity between Grand Lodges, and they didn't have quite as many committees set up and everything. No, uh, because they would meet for the comradeship and the brotherhood. The brotherhood and the comradeship were the key factors. And, of course... You know, things evolved, and like you may mention, people's opinions. And like the settlement of America, it also goes along the religious lines. You have religious groups that settle in some places just here in our region. Uh, we don't have any Quakers to speak of here because the Quakers didn't come to this region. Uh, the Lutherans, on just on the other side of the uh, PD River, they stayed over there. They didn't come across over this side of the river. So a lot of that also affected the lodges as to what Grand Lodge the jurisdiction you get your charter from. Yes. I'm, oh, I'm sure that's true. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of Scotch-Irish and in this part, in where Montgomery County is. I don't know where those lodges would have been chartered from. I get, oh, you would think the Grand Lodge of Scotland, but you don't hear a lot about the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Uh, the Irish ones were usually military lodges, mm -hmm. and usually everything down east was either an ancient or a modern. Sorensen and, uh, knows a lot about this. Ben Sorensen, Jonathan's excellent on this. So uh, it's interesting. All, all of those guys will uh, come talk to your lodge about it too. So it's, I, I find all that period of history fascinating. So anyway, after the war... The states decided that they needed their own Grand Lodges, right? And so we need, we decided we needed ours. And tell us a little bit about the formation of our Grand Lodge. Well, December 1787, it was decided to establish the Grand Lodge in North Carolina. And like you made mention, this nation has followed a track where George Washington wanted the citizens to look past their home states and look for the good of the nation. However, the track, this country has always been very strongly built upon states' rights. And rather than having a national Grand Lodge or like the Grand Lodge of England, it was decided that each state would have their Grand Lodge. 
And that's the parallel that they set up for every state. The jurisdictions were created as, of course, the westward expansion. The lodges moved west. They moved west. They established the states, the jurisdictions. But they really didn't want a national lodge overlooking everybody. And like I made mention, this country is very strong on states' rights. And the lodges reflect that parallel thinking. And so we got our, our Grand Lodge of North Carolina in 1780. December 1787. 87. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the wars. Well after the wars yeah, over. Yeah, 87. And so then, they, uh, then all lodges chartered after that would have been under the Grand Lodge of North Carolina. Some of them, I take it, were maybe healed. Right. Or I'm not sure what the word would be. They were brought in. They the were brought in. The they were brought in. And what we also had some, too, is I, I was requested to do some research on a, a lodge in Newport, Tennessee, uh, modern day. They received their original charter from the Grand Lodge of North Carolina, and they actually are in our uh, early 19th century minutes. I was able to find those at Grand Lodge. But as time went on, of course, they became the state of Tennessee, and they are now in, under their jurisdiction. But they were originally, there are several lodges in the Tennessee that met under the auspices and the umbrella of the Grand Lodge of North Carolina when they were established. And there's this really cool thing in Grand Lodge. I know y'all probably all seen it where it shows where we chartered some lodges in Tennessee and some other lodges. And then it kind of, it's like a big uh, uh, pedigree thing that goes out and how we kind of touched all the Grand Lodges out west by we charter Tennessee, <laughs> Tennessee charter Arkansas or what, wherever, you know, further and further. Well, and cool. if you look at it too, I was in uh, Ohio and Illinois uh, last year doing some research. And if you look at the majority of the folks that have lived there for a long time, the majority of men and women in Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, they're transplanted folks. Their ancestors came from the Virginia and the Carolinas, and mm -hmm. they moved and they moved west. Because as you well all know, we're all descendants of immigrants. Amen. All of our people came from uh, Europe, pretty much, or other parts of the world. Yeah, right. Uh, Montfort, you want to say a word about Montfort and how he was the Grand Master of America? The provisional Grand Master <laughs> of North America. What's interesting, uh, his you know he perished just as the War of Independence is starting, and his son was quite active, but. Uh, we know a little bit about him, but not a whole lot. He was a really interesting fellow. It must have been very charismatic to get that uh, jewel presented to him. And uh, I really don't have a lot of information with me that I can delve on because the old captain's mind's good as long as I have my notes, but I didn't bring a lot on Monfort. It's okay. I, 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 and we've talked a lot about the Revolutionary War period just because I know that's uh, kind of more your passion, passion, but you're very good on uh, the war in Northern aggression also. You want to say some things about um, maybe some of our brothers that were involved in that? The War of Secession or the, the American Civil War was the most hard chapter in this country's history where we couldn't sit down and settle things like grown-ups do. And we have at least seven factors we know that uh, result in that war becoming part of our nation's history. And you do have countless, and we have books written about uh, the fraternity, members of the fraternity, and how uh, war was stopped for Masonic funerals. Uh, one of the programs I do, it hits home with me, is the Broken Band of Brothers about uh, Louis Armistead, uh, George Pickett, and Winfield Scott Hancock on different sides during the war, but all members of the fraternity, and how uh, when, when Louis Armistead perishes after being captured at Gettysburg, uh, he gives his Masonic Bible and his watch and his spurs to Winfield Scott Hancock to get back to his family. So we know there's a very strong tie there where we have timeouts, basically, when the war is being fought, uh, heads up giving, the fraternity still there. We know instances where some of the lodges would meet together during the war. And then we have a generational shift, too. Not everybody's involved, uh, involved in the uh, war secession as a member of the fraternity, although there was a high percentage of them. Zebulon Vance? Zebulon Vance, oh, yes, definitely Zebulon Vance. Uh, governor, uh, leader, uh, very, very smart fellow. Uh, Grandmaster. His brother was Grandmaster twice, but we never hear about him. And uh, we, you know, Vance is captured, and but goes on to become, uh, the, you know, a leader in the Senate and a very, very learned fellow who saw the bigger picture and realized that the uh, the, the eleven states that tried to set up a separate nation, they realized that that wasn't going to work. And Zebby and Vance did more to come back into and heal the wounds of the nation. Although, of course, we have different viewpoints on what he did and how he did it, but. He was committed to fraternity, and he was more really committed to the state of North Carolina. It's very evident in what he tried to do and what he did accomplish for the state of North Carolina. So what's, what's really neat is, since we're talking about Zeb Vance, is I have a letter that was written by my great-great-grandfather to, to Zeb Vance uh, when the Hewland brothers were— yeah. he, it is in the halls of records in Raleigh, um, but a— um, 
PhD in history, a young lady from the University of Texas, uh, wrote a book on Montgomery County, um, and it was called The Renegade South. And in her book, she publishes that letter. She takes a picture of the letter and mm -hmm. actually puts it in there, but it's uh, by John Armstrong Beeman. Um, and it's, it's really cool. Um, so I thought that was really neat. She shared it with me about two years ago that she had found that letter and, uh, and sent it to me in the book, and it's, it's really neat. And see, that goes back to the, the personal connection, because when you get past the regiments and the brigades and the politics, there are people just like we were caught up in a time. Yeah, no doubt. Pettigrew, was he a Freemason? Do we know? Not that I can find. Graduated first in his class at the University of North Carolina, of course, the first publicly uh, funded institution of higher learning that was begun, of course, by Freemasons. But uh, yeah, Pettigrew, not that we can find. So... In the Civil War, kind of like in the Revolutionary War, the, the eastern part of North, North Carolina was occupied, mm -hmm. I guess, again, because it was close to the coast and easy for them to occupy it. There's a lot of stories about um, both wars, really, where um, you know the, the lodges were treated sometimes very well and sometimes very poorly uh, during those occupations. I understand that uh, it, which lodge had their jewels stolen and finally got them back. Was that New Bern? New Bern, and then which one, because that's a uh, wise tale, if... Uh, if William Sherman was as many places doing as many things as he had, he would still be fighting the war. But uh, collectively, George Stoneman, brother George Stoneman of the Federal Cavalry, he was very, he would post guards at the lodges. Uh, we had that several instances, where, of course, where the wives were left behind and trusted with the jewels. Uh, but more times than not, the lodges were protected by members of the fraternity in the Union Army. Uh, we do have a, there's an undercurrent that we know that uh, lodge activity continued in New Bern with, uh, with the uh, unionists that were there meeting. So like you made mention, the eastern part of the state, like Virginia, was pretty much controlled by the Federal Army because they had captured that part. But uh, masonry still continued on in those lodges. And it's funny, a lot of those men, not particularly in North Carolina, but a lot of the men, like Brother McKinley, were so influenced that they went in Virginia fighting for the Union. They became members, he became a member of the fraternity after the war, so influenced by the Freemasonry and the comradeship and the brotherhood that he saw during the war. I tell you what, I sure would love to do a show like this, but with you and Ben Sorensen and Jonathan all sitting and just talking about, uh, you know, the, the history of the state and masonry in the state, uh, specifically uh, because, you know, they're, they're historians also, and uh, they're just guys that know a lot of stuff about those particular It would be a great Scotch and cigar night. I mean, it would be. It would, and, we'll, and we'll record it. Brother, brother Ben and Brother Jonathan are very learned in North Carolina, where my realm goes a little bit further out there. Cool. Um, you want to say some uh, nice things about uh, Thomas Jefferson and, and his Masonic affiliations? We have no record that Mr. Jefferson was a member of any lodge. <laughs> we have do we do have his name listed at, at uh, Richmond number ten as a visitor, but not a member of the fraternity. And I can find no records whatsoever that that genius fellow, that young man from Virginia, was a member of our fraternity. Libertine. You want to call him a libertine? Not on the air. <laughs> So this is a running joke that Captain Campbell and I have. I, I don't think he was a Freemason either. But Captain Campbell says that he definitely was not. <laughs> and I say that it's at least theoretically possible. So we always have this thing going on about uh, We also know that pigs fly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything's possible. <laughs> anyway. All right. So we're, uh, we're down to about 10 minutes. Let's move on to just a couple of other things. Uh, let me do a few announcements here. The uh, grand installation is coming up uh, first Saturday in December. By the time this comes out, you'll all almost have missed it. Uh, but those things are open. Go to it if you can. Wilkerson College, I talked to Gary Handy a little while ago, sent him a text, asked him how registration was going. He said that they had 32 registered. I don't know how many they're going to take this year. They, uh, they used to take 36, and then last year they, I think they took 40, and I'm not sure because I'm not in that circle anymore. I'm not really sure if they're going to take 36 or 40. But apparently there's still a few slots uh, left. If you're listening to this and you haven't got your deacons registered, you probably still have time, but you better hurry up. Yep. Uh, Tony Rathbone has taken over uh, the Education Committee. That transition is effectively all, all but taking place. It uh, technically happens when the grand installation is, but uh, essentially we've, I've handed over the reins to him. I'm sure he's going to do a great job. Curry Pendleton is going to take over uh, uh, public relations. I don't know what all uh, he's got in mind exactly. We've talked a little bit, but I expect great things out of them. So, uh, you know, I'm sure that we're in good hands with all those guys in charge. They're great dudes. 
Did we talk about your postcards, Captain Campbell? Yes, we did. The North Carolina Masonic Keepsake Postcard Collection, they're available. Contact me uh, through the Speakers Bureau or my name and numbers out there. I've told all the time, but on Facebook, but I didn't know such about things. But feel contact me anytime, and uh, we're selling those to raise money for uh, or saving our old buildings and restoring uh, final resting places of our brothers. Very good. Well... I think I've exhausted all the things I'm going to talk to Captain Campbell about tonight. How about you, Riley? Yes, sir. Anything you want to talk about? I'm good, boss. I want to thank uh, thank you all for this honor setting this up tonight. I appreciate it getting the word out. Uh, and, yes, I am somewhat of a technophobia. Uh, they're trying to drag me into the 20 and 21st century. However, this is an excellent avenue for brothers to get uh, information and news all over the state, all over the country. I'd strongly recommend that. Again, the Speakers Bureau. And again, I want to tell all the brothers throughout North Carolina, I'm still out there on the Speakers Bureau, but it's been an honor to have served your grand historian for the last two years. Thank you. Hey guys, we can't tell you enough. Please have him come speak at your lodge. Awesome programs. And if you have time, find him somewhere. He gives awesome tours of all kinds of battlefields and historical places. So please look him up. He's a national treasure. Ooh. Our rock star. <laughs> Our historian rock star. <laughs> right on. Thank you for listening to this episode of Masonian. For more information and productions, please visit and like our Facebook page at 357productions or 357productions.com. You may also email us at 357productionsteam at gmail.com. Again, that's 357productionsteam at gmail.com. As always, tell people that you love them. And remember, we meet on the level and part on the square.